Like she said, okay, well, sure. The next speaker is Professor. As many of you know, that he is one of the brightest minds in the domain of aesthetics. He is currently a, a associate professor at the university. He works on uh, machine learning for decision making and control with an emphasis on deep learning and uh, research learning his research includes the development of the more end to end uh, training of these neural network policies, and scalable algorithm for inward reinforcement learning, different reinforcement learning, and so on and so forth. Let's welcome Sergey. Great. Thank you, everyone, for the, uh, uh, <laughs> for the warm welcome. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about a, a, some recent work that we've done in my group on building a kind of a general purpose. Oh, there's a one second. Sorry about that. Let me get this out of the way. There we go. Um, and I think I need this. Okay. On building a general purpose robotic navigation model. So let me start off with a, a little bit of a motivation. So um, it used to be that if we wanted to, let's say, build a computer vision system to, let's say, con construct a segmentation or uh, an image classifier or image captioning, we would train separate models for each of these things. And we would require, you know, fairly large labeled data sets for each domain to get a corresponding model that would address that domain. Um, the same thing for things like visual question answering, even you know, tests outside of computer vision, NLP, uh, sentiment analysis, summarization. Each of these was a separate task with a separate training set and a separate dedicated model, typically with its own dedicated architecture. Uh, of course, most of you who are nodding in the audience already know where I'm going with this, that increasingly these days, uh, the way that we approach all of these problems is by taking a very large typically weakly labeled or even fully unlabeled data set and using it to train some kind of very large unsupervised or self-supervised model, what some people call a foundation model. And the idea is that by training a single model that can serve as a backbone for a variety of different tasks, we can use much larger sources of data, sources that are unlabeled or weakly labeled that wouldn't be able to be used for something like uh, visual question answering by themselves. And then, of course, we would take a, a small or moderate amount of data for the desired task and either fine tune our pre trained backbone, or maybe with the most modern architectures, even prompt them in few shot to perform the task of interest. And of course, we've seen uh, a lot of consolidation around uh, th this kind of principle in computer vision with things like self supervised representation learning methods in NLP with things like large language models, uh, BERT, GPT, and so forth. Uh, but also, the other trend that we're seeing increasingly more of, especially in the past year, is the consolidation even across modalities, where we could imagine having multimodal models that can uh, ingest multiple kinds of inputs and uh, serve as backbones for perhaps all of the uh, potential prediction tasks we might want to solve. So this is an example for the Paul Mee paper uh, from Google that I was involved in, where the robotic navigation model look like. So if we want to apply a uh, notion of consolidation, being able to leverage more sources of data for a general purpose pre-trained backbone, how can we go about doing that? And you can call this whatever you want. You can call it a navigation foundation model, a navigation backbone, a pre-trained navigation model, whatever it is. Uh, the point is to do for navigation what BERT or, or GPT did for language or what CLIP did for computer vision. Uh, that's a very ambitious goal. I don't think what I'm going to show you accomplishes that goal, but perhaps it gives us a hint about how we could take a step in that direction. So uh, roughly speaking, you can think of it like this. We're going to take a very large and heterogeneous data set of navigational data, so not just autonomous driving data, not just data from sidewalk robots, but data from a variety of different robotic platforms that are all performing different kinds of navigation behaviors. And then we're going to try to build some kind of general navigation model trained on top of this data that can then be adapted to a variety of downstream tasks. And this model needs to capture some basic understanding of the, the kinds of concepts that go into navigation, understanding obstacles, understanding navigational affordances, uh, generalizing across platforms, 
This model does not have to be able to perform every possible navigation task straight out of the box, but just in the same way that, for example, BERT serves as a pre-trained backbone, this should serve as a pre-trained backbone to then enable uh, adaptation to individual tasks, like autonomous driving, sidewalk delivery. Uh, I'll, I'll show some demos of RL for offload, off-road driving and things like that. Okay, so what are the challenges that we have to deal with to make this happen? Well, we have to figure out appropriate uh, algorithms, uh, and these algorithms need to be suitable for leveraging very diverse kinds of navigational data. So they need to make very weak assumptions about how that data is actually labeled. In the same way that, for example, you could train a language model on any text data you can pull off the internet, our aim with algorithms here will be to develop the kinds of methods that can leverage any kind of navigational data so that we can use as much of it as possible. We'll, of course, need to be able to collect large robot data sets. Uh, and then we'll need to design flexible and general models that could be pre-trained on all this data that are scalable enough, and that can also be adapted to the downstream tasks that we might want to solve. So let me start with a brief discussion of uh, algorithms. So uh, what do we want to actually learn uh, from this navigational data? So what objective can we use to learn general navigational common sense from diverse data sources? So we're going to have all this heterogeneous data. We're going to pull it from uh, all sorts of different robots doing all sorts of different things. That's going to go into some big bucket. We're going to run some algorithm on that. And whatever comes out from running that algorithm needs to be suitable to be adapted to autonomous driving, uh, you know, off-road ATVs, sidewalk delivery, controlling spot to run around and inspect buildings or whatever. So something that is flexible enough for all this stuff. Well, if we want to try building an algorithm like that, we could start uh, by taking some inspiration from other domains that have been successful at this. So what do unsupervised or self-supervised learning methods in vision, NLP, and so on actually learn? Like, what do they look like? Uh, well, here are a few examples. So BERT, uh, BERT predicts missing tokens. So you take some sentence, you mask out some tokens, and you predict them. Uh, language models, they predict the next token, very similar principle. Uh, Self-supervised learning methods in vision, like SimClear, well, they're going to transform the image in some way and predict representations of the cropped or transformed image. So in all these cases, we're predicting some kind of missing piece of the data. So all these methods essentially fill in the blanks. They're training on completion of incomplete data, and by figuring out the right little, the right bit to hold out and complete, they can acquire a fairly general understanding of what's going on in that data. So this is great because it doesn't require very strong supervision. It doesn't require, uh, for example, uh, ground truth class labels uh, or even a notion of classes. And therefore, it can be run on all available data. So if you can take your data set and you can hold out some piece very carefully and force the outcome to complete it, that can be a foundation of a really good self-supervised method. So that's what we're going to do for navigation. Um, the objective that we're going to formulate uh, is going to complete parts of navigational trajectories. Now, we could complete them by actually filling in raw sensory observations. That's pretty hard because it's a very high-dimensional completion problem. And also, a lot of the stuff that you end up figuring out when you're completing observations is not actually all that useful, like, for example, the shape of the clouds in the sky. So we're not going to complete that. We're going to actually complete uh, actions and temporal distances. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so you have to be careful in selecting which bit to fill in. And the prediction problem is going to be set up as follows. Given current observations, so a little history of what you've seen before, so that basically allows the model to figure out where it is and what's going on in the world, and given a goal observation, which during training will just be some future time step in that same trajectory, uh, maybe uh, a few minutes into the future, predict the current action to take, and predict the time steps to that goal, basically the temporal distance. So this is very useful for the following reasons. Uh, first, you figure out which actions will get you to different places in the future. So that allows you to understand the relationship between observations and control. And by filling in these temporal distances, now you figure out how far apart things are. So that gets you an understanding of the connectivity of the world. And these are very basic uh, things that you need to understand to do navigation. So for example, uh, if the goal is very far away, you'll figure out that it's far away, even though it might be, uh, you know, visually it might be somewhere nearby. Maybe there's an obstacle in the way and you figure out that there's something uh, real about obstacles by understanding that things are far away if there's an obstacle in between you and them. So there's a lot that's captured in this, and the, uh, I won't go into it in this talk, but actually this notion that I presented very intuitively can be uh, quite a bit more precise because these temporal distances in the parlance of reinforcement learning are actually equivalent to value functions. And we know that uh, if you can figure out value functions, uh, then you've actually figured out good representations for uh, decision-making problems. So that's a separate discussion, but for now, uh, hopefully that intuitive explanation will be somewhat satisfying. Um, so it's a very general objective. You can do this with any navigational data as long as you have uh, sequential observations and corresponding uh, actions. You can do this. If you don't have actions, run structure for motion and figure out your actions. So that's actually pretty straightforward. 
It captures collision avoidance and basic navigational common sense because you'll never see a future time step that cannot be reached, right? If you saw it in trajectory, that means it is reachable, at least for that robot. And it's directly useful for zero-shot navigation. So conceivably, you could actually straight up feed goals into this model and ask it to take images, and it will actually drive uh, a robot or a vehicle. But it could also be used in other ways. Okay, so that's basically the algorithm we're going to use. Very simple. Uh, and by the way, this kind of uh, this kind of thing can be trained with st standard supervised learning. You can also use offline reinforcement learning if you want to get shortest paths rather than just the paths in the data set. And in the experiments that I'll show, we'll actually use a little bit of both. Uh, supervised learning is simpler. Uh, reinforcement learning can be really helpful if you want to initialize for online RL later down the line. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, okay, so let me describe some work that we've done that actually uh, uses this method first just for straight up doing goal reaching, but then we'll extend it as a general pre-trained backbone. So this is a project that we did uh, at this point about three years ago, where we just wanted to explore this way of training models. So the, the user specifies uh, an image as a goal. In this case, they take a photograph of their front door, and the robot is supposed to deliver something, you know, it delivers in this case some mail or a, or, or a pizza to their front door. Okay, very straightforward problem setup. Uh, find uh, and navigate to a given goal landmark using only camera observations. So there's what the robot sees, there's the goal, and the robot is supposed to figure out the actions in between that'll get it to the goal. Uh, and I'll show a lot of these kind of aerial views in these slides. Uh, unless stated otherwise, the robot actually only gets the first person view, and then the aerial view is just extracted from GPS just for your visualization so you can see what it's doing. So the model is pretty much a straightforward uh, instantiation of the idea from before. There's a column net that takes in the current observation, a column net that takes in a goal observation, and it predicts the number of time steps between them and the action to take uh, at, the, at the current step. And that's just supervised directly with the data set. Now, by itself, this kind of model can reach nearby goals. Think like, you know, on the order of like 50 meters in front, in front of you or to the sides. If you want to reach very far away goals, then you have to combine this with some kind of planning approach. And it turns out that a really, really simple planning approach works great here. So we use uh, a topological map that's constructed from other observations the robot saw in the environment. So this is not running SLAM. This is not trying to actually map out the environment. This is just taking other images the robot saw. All you need for this is, is the images, connecting them with a graph where the edges of the graph are the distances predicted by this model. So for the endpoints of each edge, you feed in the images of the model, ask it to predict the distance, and label the edge with that distance. And now you can use that graph to plan paths to distant goals. Of course, you need to have driven around the environment before to collect those images, but we'll get rid of that assumption shortly. For now, assume that you've driven around there before, and you can reach distant goals. Um, one of the cool things about this project when we first did it is that we actually, you know, taking a step towards leveraging large data sets, we actually didn't collect any new data for this. We actually just used all the data that we had collected in our previous uh, navigation research. So we had done a bunch of navigation research before that for other projects, and we just took everything, trained up this model, and it was able to navigate around uh, some outdoor environments uh, up in Richmond, Richmond Field Station north of uh, UC Berkeley. So that was pretty neat. Um, but then, of course, we wanted to relax this assumption that we uh, require having seen images in our environment before and actually turn this into a viable navigational system that can solve some real navigational problems. Uh, and the way we did it is by basically giving the robot uh, a map, not a, a, a reconstructed SLAM map, but like literally a, a, a map, like the kind you get from Google Maps. Um, and that's turns out to work great. Uh, in fact, you can just give it a satellite image. So the idea is that we had our goal condition model, and just like before, we predict the distance to the goal and the action. And we'd also predict a, now an additional GPS offset. So not the GPS coordinate, but just the offset from its current location. And that you could then use to index into um, a satellite image. And then we would give the robot a satellite image and train a separate model to act as a kind of heuristic, think like A-star search heuristic. And this heuristic would basically uh, guess the answer to the following question, given the current state and the final destination, which might be very far away, um, and some predicted waypoint that's on the way there is the waypoint on the path to the final goal. So we would learn, like, for example, if the waypoint is an intersection and uh, the intersection looks like, you know, like the, the one in the picture there, that it's on the way to the goal, that's like maybe a good waypoint to go to. But if it's in the opposite direction, that's a bad waypoint to go to. Um, and the point was that this was supposed to serve as a heuristic to just bias uh, the robot in the right direction. And now we could actually use this to drive around environments that had not been uh, mapped out in advance in the sense that we don't have those first person images, we just have the satellite image. Um, so the heuristic was trained with contrastive learning kind of in a fairly obvious way. So you would just take positive pairs and negative pairs. 
And then we would combine this with the navigation model into what we kind of, you can think of as almost like a physical A star search. So the robot would be building this graph as it goes. So it would start off in a new environment where it hasn't seen any images before. As it traverses that environment, it adds additional images to the graph with edges computed by the model. And when it comes time to select a new node to navigate to, it would use this heuristic to pick which way to go. Uh, or if any of the existing nodes have a higher heuristic value, just like an A star search, it would backtrack and go to one of the existing nodes. And that would be very convenient if it got stuck in a dead end. So here's a video of this in action that hopefully makes it a little bit more concrete. So over here, you'll see the satellite image. In the lower left, you'll see the um, first person image. Uh, this is about a kilometer. The course here is about one kilometer in length. Uh, the goal is in the lower right-hand corner. That's the green circle on the map. Um, you can see the robot does a pretty good job puttering around this environment. The, the environment had not been seen before, uh, except for the satellite image. Uh, mostly it does very sensible things. It kind of gets biased towards the goal. It cuts across this grassy field. So it's not trying to obey any rules of the road by any means. Um, at one point, it does actually go into a parking lot where it gets stuck, so it just backtracks and goes back onto the road and finds a better path, and then eventually it reaches the destination. Uh, so this is a, basically the first time it's seen this environment. The only thing that it's provided is the satellite image and the coordinate of the goal. Um, this thing can traverse uh, paths that are about a kilometer in length. If you give it some intermediate checkpoints, we took it on a hiking path that was 2.7 kilometers long, so that was pretty neat, although we did have to tell it uh, the key uh, milestones along that path. Otherwise, it would try to go off-road through the forest, which would not be fun. Uh, certainly not fun for the student having to follow it around. Um, because the satellite image is used only as a heuristic, this thing can actually handle situations where the satellite image is not correct. So here uh, in the example in the top right, someone parked a semi-truck across this path. The satellite image has a, a clear path there. Uh, but when the robot approaches the semi-truck, the first person view tells it that this path is not traversable. So then the uh, navigation model says, okay, I can't actually go through there and finds a, a route around the parked semi-truck. Um, this can work with heuristics computer from other data. So of course the satellite images are the best. That's the one shown in blue. Uh, if you just give a GPS coordinates, but no satellite image, that's the pink path, then it's still biased in the direction of the goal. Of course, it doesn't know where the obstacles are. So it has to backtrack quite a bit more. If you give it neither GPS coordinates nor the satellite image, it'll essentially do kind of a random frontier search, which is not terrible, but it, in this case, it's a little too hard for it. Uh, but it can still reach nearby goals in that case. Okay, but this is not going, this is not yet, providing us that pre-trained backbone for other tasks. This is just validating the notion that training a model to reach goals in this way does something. It does some kind of reasonable navigation. We can start using it for other stuff though. And um, we'll, we'll build a much bigger model later that can be even more flexible, but just to give a preview of the kinds of things that can, uh, it can be used for to convince you this is a fairly flexible recipe. Let me tell you about a project that we did about adding language instructions. And here we were able to add language instructions to this kind of pre-trained model without actually changing the model at all. Um, so the way that we add language instructions is we, is we just use a language model to interpret the instruction. The instruction might be like, you know, after passing the white building, take the right next to whatever. Interpret the instruction using a language model to turn it into a sequence of uh, landmarks, essentially a sequence of waypoints. And then take the observations that were seen in the environment, run a vision language model to figure out which semantic objects are present. And then when planning through the graph, essentially generate a plan that accords with the instruction, meaning that the plan has a very high probability of visiting the landmarks that the instruction is actually describing. Uh, and notice here that the, the vision part, the actual navigation model, is not changed at all. It's literally the same exact model. So all that's being done is just a vision language model is being welded onto it to interpret the semantic content of the images, and then that's incorporated into planning. So the vision, uh, 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 the visual navigation model gives us the temporal distances between the nodes. That's what VNM means. The language model transcribes uh, an instruction into a sequence of landmarks. And then a vision language model, in this case, CLIP, basically associates language with the individual images that we've seen. And then you do a, a big joint decoding, which can be formalized as a kind of graph search to figure out a sequence of, of nodes that both has short distances between them and visits the landmarks that were described. And then you can do stuff like this, where you can tell it, uh, go straight towards the white building and right uh, to the stop sign, look for a glass building car, and then the robot will decode that into a path through the environment, drive around until it visits each thing. So here it goes to the stop sign, takes a look at the stop sign. Uh, then it's going to go to the white car. That's the second one. Notice it says after passing the white car. So it'll go to the white car and then we'll go to the class building. So 
the point I wanted to make with this project is just that once you train one of these goal condition models, it's not just for doing goal images, right? Like then you can weld a front end to it. In this case with language, you could weld onto it a front end with other things and actually use it to perform a variety of tasks. Okay, uh, now this was still at a somewhat more modest scale. This is co still controlling a single robot. Uh, let's talk about scaling this up a little bit. So first, can we get a one policy that can control many different robots? It turns out that that's to, somewhat to our surprise, this was actually not that hard to do. Uh, so we're going to use basically the same model with one small modification that I'll describe shortly. And really the key to making this happen was just to collect the right data set. So we uh, essentially uh, called up all our friends and we said, hey, if you've got some robot navigation data, can you send us your robot navigation data? And we collected a bunch of robot, robot navigation data. By the way, if, you, if you're if you in the audience and you send us something, thank you. Uh, we got data from everything ranging from a full-size ATV down to a small-size RC car. There's some data from Spot Robot that uh, someone had put on the internet. So there's a whole bunch of different stuff in here uh, ranging in size. Uh, and the model that's trained on this data set is actually almost exactly the same. The only modification is that now, instead of getting the current observation from a robot, it's given a little temporal context, basically a little history of frames. And that's really useful for essentially figuring out what kind of robot you're driving, because if in that temporal context, you see it making really sharp turns, well, perhaps this is a robot that can make sharp turns. Uh, we thought we would need to work harder at getting the model to really understand something about the robot it's controlling, like maybe give it some parameters of the robot. It turned out that that wasn't really necessary. Maybe it will be necessary if the robots differ more drastically, but in this case, just that little temporal context proved to be sufficient. Um, and uh, the other thing that kind of surprised us here is that we could then take this model and actually have it generalize in zero shot to entirely new robots. That's actually, at least to me, this was pretty shocking. So for example, this drone here, I'll talk about that more later, it was never trained on drones before. Um, and it, this is the first time it's flying a drone. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how this thing generalizes. Um, well, first, it generalizes to a lot of things. Uh, so this is just a collage of all the different kinds of experiments that the students ran, all using exactly the same model. Uh, and you can see here everything from outdoor robots to indoor robots, turtle bots, local bots, drones, et cetera. Um, and it, control, it could control all of them. Um, in fact, it could control pretty much any robot, ground robot we had in the lab. Um, if you have other robots you want us to try, you can send them to us. Um, we, we also found surprisingly that this model was much more robust to physical changes to the robot. So here we stuck a, a stick into the wheel of the robot, which changes its dynamics to kind of simulate mechanical damage. And just to prove that this mechanical damage is non-trivial, if you command the robot to drive in a straight line, uh, before the damage, it goes in a straight line. After the damage, it veers off to the side and crashes into the bushes. So this is really changing the dynamics of the robot in a meaningful way. Uh, the GNM actually does a pretty good job of controlling the robot, even with the damage, I guess because once the robot is modified in this way, it just looks like a different robot. And if you can generalize across robots, then you can generalize to a damaged robot. So that's great. Um, this is the drone. Now, I will uh, give a caveat here. The drone is pretending to be a car. So the drone is flying at a fixed altitude. The model is not controlling altitude because it doesn't understand altitude. It only understands ground vehicles. But other than that, there was no modification made to the model to do this. Uh, and straight out of the box, it could fly the drone around hallways. So that's pretty cool. That means that it really is figuring out some general notion of obstacle avoidance. Um, the other thing we could do with this model is we could modify it a little bit to pre-train it with offline RL and then do online RL fine tuning for high speed driving. Now, of course, you'll notice the video in the lower right is anything but high speed driving because this is what it does more or less out of the box. So out of the box, it comes equipped with some rudimentary ability to drive this rally car. Um, it's actually worse than the GNM out of the box because we reset the last layer because we're going to run a, a different online RL algorithm, but it's kind of decent. Um, and then that's five minutes in. So five minutes in, it's kind of, you know, roughly making its way down the hallway, although periodically bumping into things. And then we're going to keep training it with online RL. We use a very efficient algorithm called RLPD, and it's learning from raw pixels here. Uh, so this is five minutes in. Um, here it is uh, 15 minutes in. Now, 15 minutes in, it still collides occasionally, but it's starting to do a much better job of making its way around this building. The racing course here is just to race around the fifth floor of Soda Hall, which is a building on the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, so it's certainly not racing at this point, it's driving kind of at a moderate speed, but it is getting much, much better at following the hallways. And then 25 minutes in, it actually starts going pretty fast. Um, it uh, actually kind of doesn't look so fast from a third person view, uh, but this is like pretty much near the top speed that we, uh, that we could do uh, without risking the vehicle damaging itself. It's also pretty close to the uh, fastest route that the uh, human driver, the uh, expert uh, driver, I guess, who's the grad student, could do from the first person view. If you let the grad student drive it from the third person view, they can actually do a little bit faster. But from the first person view, this is about the, the max you could manage. Um, so 
that's pretty cool. And that's 25 minutes, right? So for those of you that are familiar with reinforcement learning from raw pixels, learning in the real world in 25 minutes is actually not very easy. Um, you can do the same thing outdoors. Uh, part of the reason why it's so efficient is, of course, because it has that really powerful pre-trained backbone to start from. So this is the beginning of training. Um, it's supposed to race around a building. Now, of course, just like indoors, at the beginning of training, it's not doing that great of a job, but it's doing something. It's kind of roughly making its way around, bumping into things periodically. And here it is uh, at the end of training. Now, there are a few cool things you can notice. Outdoors, of course, the train is much more interesting. So one of the nice things it can do is it can maximize how much time it spends on those paved path, paths. It's not perfect at this, but it's pretty decent. Part of why it has to go on the grass here is that the waypoint, the checkpoint that it has to go through is actually on the grass. But after it gets, goes through that checkpoint, it beelines towards the uh, paved path and tries to keep some time on there to go a little faster. Um, so it actually does a pretty good job of racing around this building. Uh, and again, we found that this was about as fast as, as the uh, grad student uh, who was doing the project could do himself from the first person view. So this is the first person view. I think it actually looks a lot faster from first person because the vehicle is small. So when you see it third person, it looks kind of slow. First person, you realize that given its size, it's actually going pretty quick. Okay. Um, so that's online RL fine tuning. And that's pretty nice. I, I was pretty happy with this result because generally, you know, I've worked on online RL a lot and learning a policy from pixels in 25 minutes is that's quite a bit faster than anything I've seen before. Uh, but let's try to scale this up even further. Let's see if we can get towards something that looks much more like a real foundation model that can be adapted to a wide variety of downstream behaviors. So what we're going to do next is we're going to take the same basic recipe, the same kind of uh, prediction problem, but we'll scale it up uh, to have a much larger transformer-based model uh, that it's going to take a, a tokenized version of the observation history and a tokenization of the goal. Uh, it's going to have quite a few more parameters. Uh, this is small by transformer standards, but it's huge by uh, robotic policy standards. So it's about 30 million parameters. Uh, and we're going to solve the same problem, temporal distance and normalized actions. But then what we're going to do with this model is we're going to see how far we can push in terms of generalization and how we can adapt it, how we can fine tune it to downstream problems. Um, so we're going to uh, build this model, which we call VINT, the uh, Visual Navigation Transformer. And then we're going to use it for zero-shot navigation, uh, for exploring new environments, and uh, for adaptation to new tasks. Um, so first, let's talk about uh, the zero-shot stuff. Let, let's talk about how we can use it to explore a new environment. So the problem is, of course, we need to feed it goals to explore a new environment. And um, if we visited other places in that environment before, we can just give it the images that we've seen before. But if we haven't been in that environment before, we have to produce the goal images somehow. Uh, that might seem like a pretty difficult problem. In fact, when people think about these goal image condition policies, that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks. But fortunately, uh, we've gotten as a community pretty good at generating pictures. So we're just going to use the best models for generating pictures, in this case, a diffusion model, to basically propose goals. So the diffusion model is literally going to take what the robot sees now and produce pixels for a potential goal to explore. Uh, and then uh, Vint is going to navigate to that goal. And here you can see the navigation in action. Now, something kind of funny that many of you might have noticed is that the goals shown on the right, these are generated pictures, uh, not all of them look very good. Some of them are, seem like they're in a completely different environment. But there's just enough good goals there, just enough goals that are feasible for the robot to visit, that VIN still does the right thing. Because remember, the, the VIN model itself is pretty robust. It actually understands how to avoid obstacles and things like that. So if the diffusion model, let's say, half the time produces garbage goals, but the other half produces sensible proposals, then VIN will actually do something sensible with it and actually explore the environment properly. And that's pretty neat. That suggests that the robustness of the model is actually making it easier for us to use it for downstream behaviors. Uh, we can use it to control, in this case, a, a goal one, a quadruped in zero shot. So uh, since we already tried the drone before, the drone still works, but we want to do something new. So we had it uh, control a quadruped. This is uh, on the UC Berkeley campus. It actually wasn't trained on campus itself. We're trained in these outdoor environments in Richmond Field Station and indoor environments. But since there's enough of them, then the campus also worked. Um, but we can also adapt this to tasks that are um, not expressible with image goals. And here we take an approach that's very heavily inspired by prompt tuning. Uh, so the idea is this, that Vint takes in the current history of observations from the robot and representation of the goal. But what we can do is we can replace the goal with some other modality, like, for example, a turn-by-turn -turn instruction, uh, turn left, turn right, go straight. And the way that we, we're going to do this is we're going to basically cut off the encoder for the goal and train a new encoder that encodes whatever new goal modality we have, like these turn-by-turn -turn instructions, into the same token representation. So the rest of the model is left frozen, and only the goal encoder is retrained to interpret the new modality. Now, this is getting a lot closer, in my opinion, to what you'd expect from a solid pre-trained backbone, just like you can fine-tune BERT, for example, to do new, new text classification tasks. You can fine-tune a new encoder on this thing to get it to solve new types of goal modalities. Um, so we experimented with a few different things. We experimented with navigating GPS coordinates, and we also... Uh, 
experimented with uh, taking turn by turn instructions, like think the kind of instructions you get from Google Maps, like turn left at the next intersection. Uh, the basic navigational common sense from Vint is, is retained, but then this ability to interpret new commands is acquired. So this is an ex a small experiment in Carla, uh, where every time the robot approaches an intersection, there is some top-down uh, high-level planner that basically tells it left, right, or straight. It's just a three-way three uh, discrete uh, command. Uh, and it can successfully drive around in Carla doing you know, basic things like lane keeping. This is not by any means a sophisticated autonomous driving system. It's just a proof of concept that the same uh, Vint backbone could be fine-tuned to a very different scenario. The other thing is, of course, that this was pre-trained entirely on real data. Carla is not real data, but that's fine. So you do need a little bit of data to actually do the fine tuning, but of course, much, much less than what you would need to learn this from scratch. Um, okay, so uh, a few takeaways and perspectives. The goal with all of this was to really do for navigation, or at least start to do for navigation, what Bird and GPT do for language and what Clip does for vision. I don't think it's by any means done yet, but hopefully this illustrates that something like this could be possible. Uh, there's still a lot of questions that remain. Uh, of course, different navigational contexts have very different rules and conventions. For example, if you're driving a sidewalk robot versus you're doing autonomous driving with a full-size car, they have different and very contradictory rules, right? In fact, for the sidewalk robot, it's the exact opposite. How do you handle this? Well, so far, we're just handling it through raw fine-tuning, but it would be very nice to have a model that's more flexible to receive some description of how it's supposed to drive in its current context. The current model doesn't do that, but you could imagine things like language conditioning could enable that in the future. Um, so perhaps we could incorporate more complex prompting, perhaps... Uh, perhaps something like in-context learning by prompting with demonstrations or language descriptions or other sorts of, uh, of modalities that could conceivably uh, be built as an extension on the current goal prompting technique. Uh, perhaps we could generalize to platforms of very different capabilities. So, so far, we assume that all these robots can be commanded with waypoints in 2D. Uh, that's why the drone flies at a fixed altitude, but conceivably it could be extended to have different action spaces with tokenized actions that's not too difficult to set up in terms of the model. So there's a lot of interesting questions and I think it'd be really exciting to study those in the future. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, I have a bit of philosophy, but I'll save the philosophy for the panel discussion, and then I'll stop here and take questions. I'm using the finish by philosophy, but I'll ask you a philosophical question. I'm great work, and we are following your work. Uh, you're cheating for you on side. Um, Looking forward to you know borrowing your ideas and applying to our um, applying our work. Uh, I'm from Motional, by the way. So the question is, um, you're comparing the ideas between LLM and navigation. In LLM, the input is aligned, fairly well aligned. Yeah. The output is less aligned, and we fine tune for that. This is a bit opposite, right? You have you have sort of misalignment in the input and a bit better alignment in the output. Yeah. What's your experience there, like? How, how does it affect the complexity of the problem? Maybe the problem is not as complex, so we yeah. don't need to capture that much of insight. So yeah, I would like to hear a little bit more, yeah. maybe before the panel, or maybe, you know, keep, uh, feel free to save some to yeah. the panel as well. No, this is a really good question. I, um, I am afraid I don't have like a very intelligent thing to say about it. I think that, the, the, uh, but from my own experience, I guess, okay, so the uh, the first GNM paper that I described, that was really our first foray into multi-robot learning, where there is this, really big issue in terms of things not being quite aligned. For that one, I was actually surprised by how not bad it was. Like I kind of expected it to be a complete disaster. My my hope was that like, well, maybe it'll successfully control all of the robots it's trained on, but it actually turns out to be able to control all sorts of other robots. Now, I do think that something about navigation is special there in the sense that all the navigation tasks are structurally similar. And we did have to do a little bit of work to actually align the action spaces just insofar as putting them on the same scale. So basically the ATV is like, you know, 10 times the size of the RC car. So, it has, so it's action space is like divided by 10. But that was actually all we did. Now I have worked quite a bit on multi, uh, uh, multi embodiment policies for robotic manipulation where this kind of stuff is a lot harder. So for manipulation, it really is the case that you're lucky if you generalize to all the robots you train on. But it seems like navigation has so much structural similarity that you can, can actually get these sorts of effects. I do think this stuff will get much harder and more interesting when we start dealing with the context more properly. So we're, you know, I'm, I'm kind of shamelessly giving this talk an autonomous driving workshop, and I'm sort of hoping that people aren't going to challenge me too much on the fact that, uh, you know, that indoor navigation problem is completely different from autonomous driving. Because stuff like that, which we're not really happy. Maybe that's kind of really the next frontier to basically tell the robot not just where you want it to go, but how you want it to get there in a way that generalizes in this way. 
So that's the thing for future work. Thank you. Actually, uh, a follow-up to that. How do you evaluate these for quality, right? Because you gave a lot of um, like subjective videos to say, you know, broadly, this seems like it's working. But as you start scaling this up, mm -hmm. as you start adding new features, how do you measure how much better you're doing? Yeah, so the, the quantitative results are all in the papers. I decided not to bore you guys with the numbers. But uh, for all the things that I showed, you typically what we measure is... Um, distance traveled without collision, kind of very similar to Honda's driving metrics, distance traveled without collision, uh, number of routes in the test set that it completed successfully without colliding, time for the RL stuff, it was actually the speed of the lap. Uh, so kind of more or less what you expect. And yes, it's 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 decent. Like the multi-robot training actually does pretty significantly improve those metrics. Thank you. Thank you so much for the awesome talk. Uh, a follow-up question, actually. So, um, when we try to deploy this kind of uh, general um, general navigation model, how do we ensure the safety uh, in the real time? And let's see if we encounter out of distribution, what do we do there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so here, there's nothing that's handling that. Uh, the hope is that if you have sufficiently diverse data, then you will get more robustness. So this is something that uh, we've actually seen a lot in computer vision, like, you know, uh, People have observed multiple times, for example, that the clip model appears to be more robust than features trained on, on the uh, on ImageNet. Why? Well, because clip has more training data. So at least part of the hope is by incorporating more so sources of data, you will get more robustness. But if you want to use this in an actual safety critical setting, of course, that's not going to be good enough. So uh, sort of the presumption here is that this model gives basic navigational capability. If you want to enforce constraints and things like that on top of that, then you would use whatever is the best method for handling that. So this is kind of not really addressing that. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, also from my side, thanks a lot for the talk. You talked about uh, decomposing the problem um, yeah, of, of learning something general into the next waypoint and then the time to reach uh, the goal. And like the latter one also largely depends on what type of robot you're facing, like how fast can it be? Is that also yeah. just solved by the scale thing you just answered in the first question? or As well as by the fact that it gets a little context, right? So the, so the model actually receives uh, some previous frames from that robot uh, and that's that's basically giving it the context necessary to figure out what kind of robot it's driving now i think it's very reasonable to surmise that in general that shouldn't be enough like just because you saw the robot driving at like 10 meters per second doesn't mean it can't drive at 50 meters per second yeah. so i do think that in the long run maybe there's a better way to provide that context we found this to actually work decently well so that's why we're we're just using it but yeah probably there's a better design that could okay. be feasible. Oh, cool. makes sense thank you so uh, in traditional AV stacks, like there's would be uh, under the planner, right? So, uh, but presumably it's doing some sort of perception as well. Do you have a sense for what the model is learning in terms of occupancy or static versus dynamic obstacles? Or yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so from from like one of the ways that we can examine this model is we could, for example, give it random garbage goals. Like you can actually just feed in random numbers and see what it will do. And what it will basically do is it'll more or less drive straight while avoiding obstacles. So it kind of seems like a lot of what it's learning is avoid things that are coming right at it. Um, in fact, one of the things that we found, this is very anecdotal, we haven't done this systematically, so I'll say it, but just keep in mind with the usual, take this with a grain of salt. We actually found that the larger model, the transformer-based model, actually had much better ability to handle dynamic obstacles, dynamic obstacles being like grad students walking in front of it than the smaller model we had before and that's based on this like random goals test where we feed it in ran random goals have someone walk in front of it anecdotally it seems like the transformer actually gets better at that than the smaller model um so that's how we're testing it we haven't done this very rigorously yet though so that study is still ongoing thank you uh yeah so actually very similar to the previous question um i noticed that like with all of these models you're using 2d images as input and then your goal navigations are kind of just like well, drive forward until like maybe you hit something. Do you think that the lack of depth perception or 3D understanding is limiting this model or this like paradigm in some way? That's a good question. Um, I think there, there, there's kind of nothing stopping us from giving it depth maps or any other modality. Our, we really wanted to optimize for being able to use as much data as possible. Sure. So we basically reduced everything down to the lowest common denominator. Right, right, right. Um, I think if you really wanted to get the maximum capability, what you would probably want to do is train a model that takes in variable modalities and get it to use depth when it's available and not use it when it's not available. As far as how important depth is, I mean, my honest answer is I don't know. I think there's probably people in this room who have much better sense for this than I do. I mean, I'm kind of a learning guy, so I always 
somewhat foolishly approach this as like, well, just tell me what sensors you have and I'll do my best with them. Whereas I think people that actually build the whole thing end to end will think about what's the ideal sensor. And I think if you guys want to think about the ideal sensor, then maybe my job would be to make sure my model can accommodate whatever sensor you've got. Makes sense. Hi. My question is, have you tried building a general robotic model for other tasks such as manipulation, for example? And if yes, what are which one's easier? What are the challenges mm -hmm. that are similar? What are challenges? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I, I, I have slides on that. I just don't want to go in, into them because I'm conscious of the fact that I'm talking in an autonomous driving workshop. But um, we are doing more or less the same kind of stuff for robotic manipulation. There, we have uh, a lot of work, especially out of Google research, that studies training uh, uh, large transformer models for manipulation. In fact, the design of this architecture is virtually identical to the RT1 model that some of you might have heard of, the robotic transformer, which basically does this for manipulation. Now, I will say from my experience, um, cross-robot transfer is much easier for navigation than it is for manipulation. I could guess as to why, but the truth is I don't really know. Uh, perhaps there's more structural similarity in navigation problems. Perhaps the navigation data is much more diverse. I think that's actually a really big one. So we're doing the, the same kind of multi-embodiment multi, uh, stuff for manipulation, and it's coming along, but it's definitely not, uh, it's, um, uh, it's not something that wants to work seemingly quite as much as the navigation model. Yeah, I'm the last one. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, regarding for your models, I just thinking about like, because uh, for the sidewalk, maybe it's a real problem because of, um, there is uh, some pedestrian on the road. And also the um, sidewalk is up and down. So not only all directly go to the uh, the house. Mm -hmm. So um, how can we to solve this kind of question for the practical use? And um, do you use uh, some uh, 3D map or who will be your ecosystem to provide this kind of data set so we can go to the uh, house directly without uh, thinking about the safety issues? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is actually something that we're working on right now as an extension to this work. We actually already have a data set of sidewalk driving that we collected uh, in, in, in the city of Berkeley. Uh, right now, the approach we're exploring is basically similar to the, to the prompt tuning that I showed for Carla driving, where we're trying to essentially take a data set that has just sidewalk driving. So kind of you, you can use a basically a learning from demonstration approach to figure out what sidewalk driving means by fine tuning it on top of this model, and then do these kind of turn by turn instructions. Now, we haven't gotten that working yet, but we, we're kind of hopeful that since the Carlos stuff worked, then maybe we can adapt to the sidewalk data as well. So that's underway right now, and hopefully in, in a few months, I'll have an answer for you. Thank you for all the time.